The future of project management is changing fast. On Projectified with PMI, we'll help you stay ahead of the trends as we talk about what that means for the industry and for everyone involved. I'm Stephen W. May for Projectified with PMI. For an easy way to stay up to date on Projectified with PMI, go to iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, and PMI.org slash podcast. In this episode, we meet Doug Greenwell, who leads projects in one of the most dangerous and technically challenging environments on Earth, America's post-Cold War nuclear waste facilities. Doug shares the experiences, challenges, and insights behind winning PMI's prestigious Project of the Year Award. He also shares lessons learned in dealing with diverse stakeholders and an unfriendly media, and still manages to convince me that he loves his job. Doug, I've had an opportunity to read the application that you and your team submitted for to be considered for Project of the Year, and it would be an understatement to say that uh, I was impressed. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to see that in part of my preparation. So I'm very much looking forward to talking with you about it. Well, thank you. I'm looking forward to discussing it too. Yeah, this is a, a fascinating project, and I know we, we're going to have an opportunity to to get into various details of it as we talk, but just from the outset, give us the layman's version of what the project was. What were you setting out to accomplish? What problem were you setting out to solve? Uh, what were you up against? Hey, Stephen, I'd like to say up front that um, I'm doing this podcast with you Um as the project manager on AY102, I'm speaking for myself. I'm not speaking as a representative of the U.S. Department of Energy or the corporations that were involved. Uh, I'm going to give you my viewpoints on uh, how the project went and uh, and the values that were represented by the team that did the work. Well, that's good. And I think your story is probably more interesting to us anyway. So thank you for that. Okay. This AY-102 recovery project was performed at the Hanford Reservation, which is a large, I guess it's about 600 square miles reservation in southeastern Washington state in the United States. And it has a fascinating history. It, It began back in World War II and continued operating as a plutonium production Uh, site through the Cold War era and then ended that mission and since has been in uh, a cleanup mission to uh, remove the radionuclides that are left over from plutonium production. And as as part of that, um, there are 177 underground storage tanks at the site that contain highly radioactive and chemical waste. I believe it's about 25 million gallons, which uh, from a layman's standpoint, you hear that and go, wow, Uh, that, that is quite a challenge for the country, but it's, it's a legacy of um, World War II and the Cold War. So, uh, so 25 million gallons. I mean, how do we think of that in terms of volume? Is this a small lake? Is this how many Olympic size swimming pools get? What's the order of magnitude here? That's a large amount. Let's see. Uh, I think your average um, rural water system tower is about 2 million gallons. So a lot of those. Wow. Um, It's a large amount of waste. That helps. Thank you. Yeah. Um, But I want to emphasize it's it's, uh, the legacy of, um, you know, the, the history that Uh, made the United States what it is today. So it's an unfortunate challenge, but, uh, you know, this country's dedicated to cleaning up that mess and uh, uh, restoring the Hanford site to um, the beautiful high desert territory that it always was. Yeah. Well, and and I'm grateful that we have people like yourself that are uh, dedicating to seeing that, dedicated to seeing that happen. So let me get a little bit closer to the project. Um, of those 177 storage tanks, that they range in size from about 50,000 gallons to a million gallons each. There are older tanks that were built from the 1940s up to the, oh, I think the early 1960s. 
um, that were single shell tanks, meaning there was just one uh, concrete barrier between the, you know, the tank wall and the soil. Mm-hmm. And then uh, as technology advanced and we became more environmentally conscious, uh, we started building double shell tanks, which uh, have both an inner and outer containment and have a lot more uh, features to prevent and also to detect the possibility of a leak. And there's 28 okay. of those. So, Doug, about when did we start introducing the double wall tanks? Well, the the first double shell tank that was built uh, in 1970 is the subject of this project, which is AY-102. And uh, being the first tank that was built in this double shell configuration, there were some challenges in its construction. Uh, we know because there was very good records taken. And uh, some of the welding that was done in the winter time out in the desert, uh, they required rework several times. So we know um, the original construction of the tank was a contributing factor to its eventual leak. Yeah, so so helpful that you had that um, had that level of documentation, certainly. Absolutely. We, we have very good records um, throughout the years of what was put in the tanks and uh, how they were operated. So, so what we, were you up against? So how would you define the, the project itself? So there was a challenge you were facing. What were you, uh, how are you going to define success at the end? So uh, what, what was it from a kind of project overview perspective? The project um, began in 2012 when routine monitoring that we do on these double shell tanks identified leakage from the primary tank into the secondary annulus space. So we're able to get into this uh, annulus ring around the tank and we can do video inspections, ultrasonic. There's a number of techniques we can use. And through routine monitoring, we saw that there was some waste leaking into that annulus space. Uh, no evidence that had leaked into the soil column, into the environment yet, but this was the first double shell tank that um, was demonstrating failure of the primary containment. So quite a eye opener for the site and uh, caused us to uh, move forward with a very fast track project to remove the waste out of the tank to a, a different tank that was known to be sound and secure. Help us understand the risk. What what were we facing here? If this went unaddressed or if this wasn't addressed well, uh, what were the risks? What were the implications of not getting this right? Well, radioactive material has been identified as a carcinogen as well as other health effects. And uh, the contamination that's in these tanks is some of the most dangerous material in the world. Um, so we take extraordinary efforts to take care of it and make sure it doesn't enter the environment. There must not be very many people on earth that are qualified to lead that project. So how did you get here? How did you, what, what's your brief history that brought you to, uh, playing such a significant role in a project of this, of this magnitude and, um, and of this significance? So the Hanford site is run by the U S department of energy. And they also have a number of other sites around the country that were involved with the uh, weapons production mission. And uh, I've spent the majority of my professional career working on cleanup of these sites. And it's been an exceptional, challenging career, and I've really enjoyed it, and I feel like I'm doing something meaningful. So I've, I've got 30 plus years of experience working on various cleanup projects in the U S department of energy system. Fantastic. So help me understand, uh, what was unique about this? One of the things that I noticed in, in reading the, uh, the application, which was really a, a quite extensive, um, explanation and definition and summary of, of the project one of the things that came through a number of times was the first of a kind nature 
of the project. So help us understand what was unique about it. So the U.S. Department of Energy sites do have experience in retrieving tank waste at different sites, including the Hanford site, um, primarily with the single shell older tanks. And this is the first double shell tank uh, that's fairly new, built in 1970, that had demonstrated a leak. And uh, I, I tell you, we had a great deal of faith in these tanks. Um, and, and this was not a situation that we expected to encounter before the waste was treated. Uh, maybe mm. we should have uh, in yeah. hindsight, but, but we had not expected that. And uh, the challenge of pumping that waste out is not only just uh, setting up all the systems, the, the very um, safety redundant systems that we put in to move the waste to a different tank, but uh, um, we have to do it in a manner that uh, avoids any potential of exposure to the workers that have to build that equipment as well as protect the environment from a leak. Uh, I'm reminded of, uh, what is it? The doctor's creed do no harm. Yeah. Yeah. Very true in our business too. In in our efforts to clean up nuclear waste, um, we don't want to set up a situation where we, uh, release it to the environment or get a worker exposed. Uh, in fact, our workers now, when they're in these tank farms are required to wear, um, anti-contamination clothing, as well as uh, fully contained breathing apparatus, basically a scuba outfit. Mm. Um, so they're, really? they're on supplied air whenever they're working yeah. around these tanks. So, wow. And uh, that's, and that's in the, that's if they are within this, this tank farm, which you described earlier as a, you know, as a very large area. So if they're in that area, then they are on supplied air. That's correct. Wow. Okay. Thank you. So there's the potential for a leak uh, and the impacts to the environment and the community. But I, I tell you, as a manager of a workforce, my greatest uh, concern is to ensure that the workers um, are not exposed to the waste or, or just simply the industrial hazards with working around a very busy uh, site with tripping hazards and just all the, the standard industrial hazards that go along with the work compounded by wearing all that uh, protective equipment that they have to do to um, guard themselves from the radiation and chemical hazards. I want to ask you about the most significant hurdles, and I'd like to break that down into the most significant technical challenge or technical hurdle, and then the most significant human challenge or human hurdle. So let's start with the technical. When you look at the entire project from from its initial, um, the recognition of the need all the way through to having successfully delivered it, then what do you view as the most significant technical challenge? Well, again, there, there were attributes of the double shell tanks that were different than any tank that, that had been retrieved in our history that we had to overcome. Those were the technical challenges of a flat bottom working around the internal obstructions with our sluicing equipment, had to design different sluicing equipment. But I would say the biggest hurdle for us to overcome was just a sense of uh, urgency and the speed in which the project had to be performed. Uh, it actually took years from initial discovery of the leak before all of the waste was retrieved. But that's not because we were going at a... Um, average pace. It's just that much equipment had to be installed um, without compromising quality or safety. And uh, it took us about two and a half years from initial discovery to completion of construction before retrieval operations began. Wow. Uh, I appreciate you sharing that. I think, I think that helps to provide a sense of scale. Are you, uh, are you at liberty to share the, uh, the cost of this project? Uh, the cost was slightly over a hundred million dollars. Okay. So, uh, not, not a small affair. No, no. And, uh, 
Uh, we are very careful to spend our tax dollars wisely. And uh, that cost is driven primarily by the um, safety measures that we're required to take to ensure that we don't have a release to the environment, that we don't jeopardize um, the many communities in the area uh, or expose a worker. So uh, from that standpoint, the cost seems high until you consider the consequences um, of having any of that radioactive waste get out. So Yeah. So you described um, in part the technical challenge being around, you know, these double shell tanks have a large number of internal structures that created simple obstruction in just trying to do the work. The fact that they're flat bottom, which you could think of trying to finish a milkshake. I mean, it's the same challenge of trying to get to all of this material. I guess it would be the same challenge if we were to put 30 additional obstructions inside the milkshake cup then you'd have the same challenge of trying to get to all this material, the urgency that was uh, overlaid over the entire thing, and then the fact that it is an expensive and, and necessarily time-consuming, you know, two and a half plus years uh, project. Now, in the midst of all that, what did you identify as the greatest human challenge? Well, again, the work um, is very hazardous. Um, the actual retrieval equipment is remoted is is operated remotely. Uh, essentially, robotics are used. So our operators are sitting in a control room, um, looking at TV screens, and operating joysticks to move the retrieval equipment within the tanks. So just the experience of the team that was necessary to perform that work is a, it's a very highly qualified uh, workforce that you need to do that uh, on a fast track schedule. So the, the human challenge was keeping the workforce safe while they perform this project at the highest quality level necessary to keep everyone uh, from being exposed to that waste. Yeah. One of the things that keeps coming to mind for me is, as you describe it, is there seems to be so many parallels between doing this work, doing it properly, doing it well. And of course, this was this is the project of the year. So we are <laughs> we're giving you full credit for doing it well. Uh, but there seem to be so many parallels between doing this work and either working in space or working at the depths of the ocean. You know, the, the need for robotics, the need for a, a, a sort of disconnect between the actual work and the humans that are performing it, the need for uh, special equipment for the people and, of course, the work itself. And, yeah, I just keep having this image of it. It's almost like working at the bottom of the sea. That's a good metaphor. And if you think about those other uh, industries, the training that those workers go through is enormous. And it's yeah. no different in the nuclear industry. We invest uh, quite a bit of effort in our training programs. Uh, in fact, our workers are heavily involved as worker trainers. And uh, we rely very much on the uh, corporate knowledge, if you will, from the workers who've been out there many, many years and have seen uh, how to do this work safely to train the new employees. Yeah. So heavy investment in uh, optimizing human performance. My understanding is that within a matter of months, you were able to prepare a team that was then uh, appropriately skilled up and appropriately ready um, to do this as well as it was done. How did you do that? How did you manage the talent challenge? Very aggressive recruiting and hiring campaign that involved the entire company, um, our HR department, our training department, uh, all the different safety skills. Um, we organized block training with our worker trainers who have uh, extensive experience in this retrieval work. And then finally, we, you know, we don't take a new worker and put them in a high hazard work environment. We mentor them for a period of time under the wings of experienced workers. And, you know, there's a, there's a small amount of very high hazard activities, high hazard from a work planning standpoint but there's a much larger base of activities needed to support the work 
um, that we can put our new employees on so they can gain the skills uh, without being put in a situation that they're not they're not ready for. Yeah. So, so yeah. by using that approach, uh, and it was a steep challenge. Uh, we we hired over 100 people and brought them in and completed the project, meeting all of our objectives. Uh, but the human part was probably the most challenging aspect of the project, just because um, going back to your mo- metaphor of uh, deep sea or space. Um, the skill set needed to do the work is very unique and requires considerable expertise that isn't gained overnight. But we do have a workforce at Hanford that is just outstanding. Uh, we just had not planned for a very fast track project of this type. And so we had to add employees and tuck them under the wings, if you will, of our more experienced workers who were there. Yeah. Now, I realize you may not have the exact number off the top of your head, but but approximately how many people worked on the project over the two and a half plus years? You know, we actually tried to uh, get an exact count on that because uh, be, being the significance of the project it was, e- even before we had this project of the year recognition, uh, we did put out an internal recognition to all the employees who were involved because we, we knew this was not your average project and it was going to be a once in a lifetime event for them. Um, it was over a thousand people. I think wow. the number was wow. around 1100 people who had a significant involvement with the project over the years. So you must have learned a lot in that process, uh, managing and building the talent that you needed for that, uh, bringing together the kind of team that could do this well. What would you do differently if you set out to do another one? So this was AY102, if if another one, if another tank required essentially a repeat of this project, what would you do differently on the talent side? You know, that's an interesting question because uh, now that we've had a double shell tank, um, have a leak. Um, we are actively planning, uh, to be better prepared for the next one. If it were to occur, um, let me clarify one thing. These double shell tanks, uh, the way they were designed, e- even though it was back in the 1970s and eighties, they did an exceptional job designing these. And if you manage the chemistry of these tanks, well, uh, they can last for hundreds of years. So um, they are appropriate for the mission of storing this waste. Yeah. However, um, after we finished the AY2 project, clean or the, the retrieval, we've done inspections of the tank and we've learned a lot about the conditions that led to the leak of this tank that we will use to help uh, extend the life of the remaining double shell tanks. Well, to get back to your question, what would we do differently? We're in a planning process right now to say, all right, in the event that a, another double shell tank were to spring a leak in the inner containment, what would we do differently? And, and essentially, we think the approach we used was um, very good. I, I don't know that we would pick a different approach, but what we want to do is be able to do that um, twice as fast. Um, mm. And we're in a position now, um, which is much better than we were when AY102 started, in that as we're preparing for the next single shell tank farm to be retrieved, we've bought a lot of the specialized equipment that is needed for retrieval, the, the remotely operated sluicing systems and all of the infrastructure that goes around it. We have a lot of that equipment um in, in our warehouses now, whereas when AY 102 happened, um, it came on so fast, we couldn't build the equipment to even meet the timeline that we set out for ourselves, uh, to retrieve the, that tank. So, so we're challenging ourselves right now to be able to do the same approach just in a much faster, um, timeline because the longer a tank like that, um, w- that is exhibiting a leak, um, goes without removing the waste, the greater the chance that a release could occur. So, you know, if anything, I think we would use the same approach 
uh, the same techniques, the fundamentals of project management that we've learned through PMI, um, but we want to be able to do it in a much faster timeline. I'd like to hear more about the communication challenge of a project like this. So two and a half years, hundred plus million dollars, 1100 people, uh, a mix of stakeholders that ranged from the community at large, I'm sure politicians, uh, federal government agencies, private sector, the team itself. How did you approach, what was your communication philosophy? And then how did you execute that to ensure uh, effective alignment and support from such a mix of stakeholders? It was a challenging mix. Um, uh, you're right. Community, uh, Washington State, uh, they have a Department of Ecology, which is our state regulator over the project, our, our workforce, the media, uh, politicians, so all of the above were actively involved with the project. Uh, I would say my basic approach was, uh, to the extent possible, transparency. Um, the, the significance of this tank leaking in its internal liner, uh, raised a lot of concerns, uh, not only about the potential of a leak from this tank, but what does this mean to the rest of the stored waste out there? And so, um, whenever possible, we would, uh, try and update the public and with progress on how we were preparing to uh, remove the waste. We would show what the leak rate was into the annulus space, which uh, fortunately was fairly slow to begin with, but uh, over time was very slowly increasing. So we knew there was a sense of urgency. Um, so we tried to get the message out as broadly as we could and as transparently as we could. I will say from a personal standpoint, um, my experience in this industry is uh, you, you use the word radioactive or nuclear and uh, immediately um, you can spread a great deal of fear within the people that matter a lot in, in the community and uh, um, decision makers. And my best response to that is to share openly uh, everything we know about um, not only the, the good news, but the potentially bad news and the uncertainty associated with a project like that. Uh, by doing so, I think you can at least win the hearts of these people that they understand, you know, the people involved and that they care and that they're doing the best they can with what they've got. And uh, that may be the best you can do in a situation like that. I would say it's more of the multiple channel approach. Uh, mm -hmm. I will say just for the sake of um, sharing openly uh, the evolution on this project, it, it didn't start off well. Uh, the news of a leaking double shell tank um, uh, got very negative headlines. And uh, yeah. one of my greatest frustrations as a project manager is uh, there are uh, media outlets out there who will take opportunities uh, on a interesting topic to sensationalize. Give me an example of the kind of thing that might be reported uh, and the impression that would create versus what you understood to be the reality, being someone on the ground, heavily engaged in the project. Oh, I've got a real good example. Um, and I won't name the media outlet. It wouldn't be fair of me sure. to do so. Um, and actually it's a lessons learned too. And, and the lesson I'll say up front is if there are significant contingencies involved with these complex projects, you not only need to communicate the, uh, planned work that you, or the planned evolution of the project as you know it, but you also need to communicate key contingencies. So what happened was as we were retrieving this tank, we knew, uh, through our risk management analysis that there was a good chance that the leak would uh, open up by virtue of us putting retrieval activities into the tank and putting the energy required to move the waste out, that that would 
exacerbate the leak and cause uh, waste to flow into the annual space. So it uh, might have to get worse before it got better. Exactly. And uh, as we approached uh, about 92% retrieve, that's exactly what happened. Uh, in the middle of the night, um, our retrieval crews operate 24 seven and they were retrieving and, um, our sluicers were spraying in the location, which turns out to be where the primary leak sites are. And, uh, that, um, sluicing operation opened up the, the corroded through, uh, liner of the tank and, a great deal of um, annual or great deal of the liquid within the tank went into the annual space. Well, we had planned for that evolution all along. In fact, we had installed a pumping system in the annulus to pump the waste that would accumulate in the annulus back to the primary, where it could then be pumped out to the double shell tank. So, from our standpoint, our crews reacted to that situation by implementing the procedures that had been already established, uh, activating the pumping system, pumping it back to the primary. Uh, it was a planned evolution. We knew what we were doing. It, it worked flawlessly. There were media channels, including one that presents weather um, out there that most people would know uh, that have, um, you know, they report general news in the course of their weather forecasting. And they presented uh, a story of America's Fukushima at Hanford. Wow. Um, yeah. And they, they described our situation as um, some kind of a tragic event. And we're just stunned uh, watching this. And, and so the, the big lessons learned that I took to my heart was to the extent that you can, um, you need to communicate key contingencies and that they are planned for and that we're going to implement um, response actions. And that's part of the plan. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. We, we've taken a more active role in doing that in the projects going forward. So not to in any way diminish the significance of what you were dealing with and what you were working on there and the project that uh, that you were executing. But I just continue to be amazed by how the same issues, the same concerns, the same patterns emerge in major projects, whether they are dealing with radioactive nuclear waste or whether they are dealing with deploying a new ERP system. You know, that what you just described, you could change a few words and you could actually apply that in a, uh, in a large technology implementation where perhaps you know, for example, that there'll be um, a certain decline in productivity, or you know there'll be a certain decline in maybe, you know, temporarily one would hope in employee satisfaction or some other or some other factors. You know it, you've planned for it, you have a contingency in place, and yet if you haven't set expectations well, you get a similar kind of uh, blow up, you know, although maybe less significant, maybe in a more contained environment. But uh, it's remarkable to me the way those patterns continue to emerge, regardless of the type of project. I agree. Uh, what I've seen in my career is large, complex projects um, share many attributes in terms of risk management, communication, um, the, the human factor in terms of trying to maximize the performance of the work team and, and leadership. And... Uh, those those shared attributes um, are, are areas where the, you make or break these complex projects. And by the way, the world does not have the best track record on um, very large, complex projects, bringing them in on schedule and on cost, especially those <laughs> you know that exceed a yeah. billion. I, I think they just become right. so difficult to manage uh, um, that they are at great risk of uh, going long and expensive. Well, and, and, you know, to some degree, there's a, there's a, a really important factor here of the human tolerance to live in the midst of the disruption. You know, so you look at these projects that take years to deliver well, years to achieve their objectives, years to 
produce the value that they're intended to produce. And it is very difficult for people to stay focused, to stay in the game, to continue to make the sacrifice, to continue to be committed throughout that entire process. It's a, it's a significant human challenge, even when the technology is stellar. That's absolutely true. Uh, one of the things I'll, I'll mention is uh, through this project of the year experience, I got to meet the management team representatives from the other finalists. And uh, what an opportunity to uh, meet some highly talented people uh, and see some of the same types of challenges across very different industries. I'm not surprised to hear you say that. And I'm glad you got the opportunity to, uh, to connect with them. So Doug, if you came through this entire thing as you have, so they're from the start, deeply engaged, deeply involved, you've got the, uh, you've got the tattoo and the scars, uh, to show for it. If you wrote a book about the most important thing you learned in the experience, what would, what would the title be? What would you call that book? Oh, wow. Um, risk management. No kidding. It works. <laughs> oh, look, I'm an engineer Good. by training. I, I don't yeah. uh, have the I like it. Christmas title. But I, I, I'll tell you, from uh, w- w- one of the things I see in these large complex projects, because uh, I have been involved with more than, than one uh, that's been successful over the years, is that, uh, you know, we we have very well developed risk management processes. Um, PMI has, you know, a very good, um, body of knowledge associated with that. Um, but in these complex multi-year hundred million plus project, um, the, the degree that which that you need to implement risk management and keep it in the forefront of your decision-making all the way through the process is, um, uh, it's just, it's tenfold. Yeah. And, and if you don't keep your eye on that, I mean, there's so many opportunities for um, one variable to derail one of these large projects. Yeah. And which variable could it be? Well, there are many that could uh, be the problem. So, so we spent um, quite a bit of effort um, as a leadership team, monitoring and updating our risk profiles and establishing mitigation actions. And, uh, some of them I'll say we spent effort on and they, the, the risk didn't materialize or it wasn't as bad as we thought it would be. Uh, but there are others that if we had not taken the action that we had done, uh, we would not have been successful. There's just no doubt. So, yeah. So I, I think that's a life lesson for me. And then the other one is just that of leadership. Uh, I think about the project team that we put together, again, in a very fast timeline. Um, <clears throat> the principal project manager that, that we put on this had never done this uh, type of work before. Uh, has experience in the nuclear industry, but had not retrieved a um, radioactive waste tank. But we put him with uh, a select group of engineering leaders and other management disciplines that had a great deal of experience in radioactive waste tank uh, retrieval. And and we we also put other members on the team that had other uh, skill sets or just um, personality types, if you will, that... uh, provided a great diversity within the team that allowed them to not uh, default to a group think. And and I think the construct of that team and how they performed, um, which was a combination of new insights as well as uh, expertise in the field, um, was a big contributor to the success of the project. That's great. And that, that really plays to something that we've not talked about, but came through to me as I read about the project and in the conversation that we've had. Underneath this, this highly technical, dangerous, large-scale work was actually a great deal of creativity and innovation. 
Yeah, I have to say I love my job. Uh, <laughs> good, uh, good. We need more it's, people that do. That's uh, great. It's intellectually challenging. Uh, the caliber of people I work with is exceptional. I, the, this country is in good hands in terms of the nuclear industry. We, we attract some exceptionally talented people. And then the impact we have on society uh, and generations ahead is, is not trivial. So um, it, it's, it's extraordinarily challenging. It, it's not without its daily frustrations, which I'm sure every uh, interesting industry has. Um, but it's been very rewarding, and I, uh, I love what I do. That's great. Well, I was, I was going to ask you why you do it. I think you've just answered that. So one more question. You've been incredibly generous with your with your time and with your experience, Doug. I appreciate it. One more question: What do you believe is the primary reason that this project won Project of the Year? Well, again, uh, the the other finalists were exceptional uh, representations of <clears throat> projects in their industry. And, and every one of them was worthy of project of the year. Uh, it's just an amazing group of talent. Uh, I believe we won because we demonstrate, um, the most positive impact to society through the application of the fundamentals of project management. Uh, that's, that's the best way I could put it. Yeah. Um, it, it was a very successful project. It was accomplished through the fundamentals of what we've learned through, PMI and, and years of experience and, uh, and it made a big impact. So with a quick commercial there for project management, making a significant impact to society, Doug gets the last word, Doug, thank you so much for being here. It has been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure too, Stephen. Thank you very much. For an easy way to stay up to date on projectified with PMI, go to iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music and PMI.org slash podcasts.